Welcome everyone. This is another section of Amplifying Lion Voices. Uh, this has been sponsored by the uh, Clinical Translation uh, Science Institute at Penn State and Cheers uh, Initiative. Today we have, um, Oh, before I start it, let me go back for a minute. My name is Dr. Rafa Lukis. I'm currently serving as the director of JEDA, Justice, Equity, Diversity, uh, Inclusion, and the Learning as part of the CTSI. And I'm the one hosting this uh, presentation today. We'll be having today, um, before we start the session, we want to acknowledge our land. Uh, the Pennsylvania State University campus are located on the regional homelands of the Erie, Henderson, Lenape, Monogalhila, Shawnee, Susquehannock, and Wasahi nations. As a land grant institution, we acknowledge and honor the traditional caretakers of this land and strive to understand and model the responsible stewardship. We also acknowledge the longer history of the lands and our place in that history. Also, as we celebrate African American History Month during this month, let us remember that the history of slavery, racism, and injustice affected our Black African American brothers and sisters are part of the American history. So let us remember that throughout the year. Amplifying Voices is a quarterly seminar series to amplify underrepresented voices in health research that involve areas of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. We refer just to quick definitions, we refer diversity as were demographics, composition, whether it's race, ethnicity, gender, identity, sexual, age, religion, nationality, disabilities, military, veteran status, economic backgrounds, and other identities is representative, representative of the human complexity of our state, nation, and global constituency. Diversity fostered innovation in research, knowledge, production, and classroom learning, greater creativity in decision-making, and better preparation of students for work and citizen in the increasing global society. It's my hope that the Amplifying Lion Voices sections promote dialogue and encourage innovation collaborative, uh, collaboration across the research faculty and staff and students by amplifying the perspective we can foster belonging and inclusive environment across the Penn State. Finally, uh, the Amplifying Lion Voices section will develop in collaboration with the Community Health Equity and Engagement Research Programs, which is also part of the CTSI, the CHEERS, program promote community engagement, research across Penn State, spanning many disciplines with the overall goal of enhancing enhan enhancement, uh, wellness, and reducing health disparities. Today, we have the honor, and interesting enough, a fellow Puerto Rican uh, to have Dr. Alexis Santos as our speaker. Dr. Alexis Santos Lozada is an uh, assistant professor of human development and family studies a demographic and the College of Human uh, Health and Human Development at University Park. Dr. Santos' research focus on whether measures commonly included in the national surveys are capturing the experiences of historically minor minoritized populations. His studies focus on the interaction between objective markers and race and ethnicity concerning subjective outcomes. He also conducts work on demographic and public policy. His work has been supported by the National Institute of Health. He's the second son of Puerto Rican parents who moved to Hartford, Connecticut after the marriage in 1986. And he have a lot of fun memories of being in Connecticut and then he moved back to Puerto Rico. I will tell you the rest of the story because that's some of the questions that we're gonna be doing today. So I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, but again, welcome, Alexis. It's great to have you as being part of this seminar today. Hey, Rafi, thank you for having me. So one of the things that we want to do as we start this conversation, and again, we want to acknowledge all the people in the chat who have saying hello. We have around uh, 18 participants right now. So welcome everyone. Please continue to put your name and uh, where you're from so everybody knows uh, who, is about, who is participating in this section. So as we start, uh, Alexis, the first thing we want to do is just tell us a little bit about you personally. And professionally, you know, where are you, where you came from, how you even getting here at Penn State University? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, I'm, I'm the classic Puerto Rican uh, 101, you know, I grew up in 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 Puerto Rico and I uh, went uh, where I completed most of my education there. Uh, I, I think you and I share even like a common uh, hometown, right? 
Yeah. Uh, Caguas, Puerto Rico. And so, as you mentioned, my family had moved to Hartford uh, when my mom and my dad got married. And then uh, they returned to Puerto Rico when I was two years old. So I have very, very few, if, if none, memories. But I do have a lot of pictures of those years. Um, and then I, the rest of my life I spent in Puerto Rico until I left to do my PhD. And, you know, I grew up. Uh, you know, with all these classical markers that you find in the stereotypes, you know, going to church every Sunday. I grew up surrounded by a big family because we lived in my grandmother's house. So multi-generational uh, layers of support there. I also lived within a family enclave. So two houses down was my aunt. Three houses down was my great grandmother. Uh, two, four houses down was a, a great aunt. And I do, I, I never felt, even if my mom and my grandparents were not around, I never felt alone because I could just walk to the next house and talk to my aunt or my cousins. Um, and I completed my education in Puerto Rico, the University of Puerto Rico at Calle, which is uh, the equivalent of a Commonwealth campus for the University of Puerto Rico. Uh, and it's nested into a valley. Uh, it's, it's up in rural areas. It's a beautiful place. And there I was initially admitted to study accounting. And uh, I did... I did the one year of accounting, I didn't like it. And I actually started thinking, what, what is it that I really like? And I really like data. And back then, uh, working with data meant playing with Excel a lot, not getting data sets from online and stuff like that. But I did spend a lot of time learning Excel. And I said, well, I'm gonna try and go study statistics. And that campus didn't have uh, a statistics program, but it did have an economics program. And that's how I started doing a lot of the data analysis uh, work that I did. I learned a lot of history of economics. And afterwards, I, I went to the main campus of the University of Puerto Rico and uh, completed a master's in economics, focusing on uh, the dismantling of the healthcare system after the 1993 healthcare reform in Puerto Rico. And you can see how Puerto Rico had this big well-distributed healthcare centers, well-planned across the whole island and in every county they have a, a healthcare center publicly funded. And then in 1993 with the healthcare reform, they started selling them all and pretty much saying, you know, it's it's free, free markets. Let's see which ones are gonna make it. And thus far, you know, about 60% of them have closed and it was a very good study. And I can tell you a little bit about that later. Uh, and then I moved to San Antonio, Texas, uh, wow. a place I I really uh, enjoyed being at, I, a place I still, I, I loved a lot, you know, it, because, you know, moving from Puerto Rico, I thought it was going to be a big change. But when I got to San Antonio, you know, there was a couple of salsa clubs that I could go to. There was amazing, <laughs> food, amazing people. And, and I, I guess the bigger change was when I came to State College. Sure. Uh, and I came here on, uh, on a one-year contract to start a, an applied demography program, which successfully launched um, and, and now it's being sunsetted, uh, but that's not part of the, the conversation today. But uh, essentially I was here for one year and then it turned into a two years. And then I had, uh, I surrounded myself with an amazing uh, group of supporters of, of particularly uh, one person who is in the, in the room uh, right now, JD Daw who pretty much uh, were able to like encourage me and continue encouraging me to keep doing research, even though I was a teaching faculty and even provided some, some support. And for that, I'm very thankful. And that was actually what got me to make the jump to HDFS. And, uh, and I've been here for six years. And I know we have more questions, but aside from that, uh, you know, I, I like Caribbean food. I like to dance. I like music. I would love to spend my whole day surrounded by music, and I love and, and I love doing research, and I'm happy to be able to share some of my experiences with you guys. Well, that's great. One of the things you should share. I also started at the University of Puerto Rico Calle campus, uh, so Los Toritos de Calle. I started there, but then I ended in traffic to Penn State my, after my third year there. So another thing we share in common. I didn't know that that little bit about it. So let's move forward. Uh, you started, you know, I know the story that you shared with me as we talked a few weeks ago, and it's part of your uh, bio that I didn't read because I wanted you to really spend some time talking about it. 
you know, you share some of the histories, some of the things personally that went through your life, to your family and so on, that basically led you to develop these research focus areas that you have developed right now. So tell us a little bit more about it. You know, what was the personal experiences, the professional yeah. experience that get you to where you are now? Absolutely. So when I was in, when I moved to San Antonio, you know, the first time away from my family, away from my grandmother and who at that point was going through dialysis and I, I would call every day to my house to see how Scrama doing. And the answer would be, oh, you know, sometimes she's doing well, sometimes she's not doing well. But one, some days, some couple of days, the answer would be, abuela está regular. Yep. And, and, you know, regular can mean a lot of things. It can mean so-so, más o menos. It can mean better than yesterday, but not at full percent. I mean, it's a very interesting word. And when I was working with a national survey of uh, the National Health Interview Survey, I had uh, noticed that the Spanish translation of that word was regular for, for one of the bad categories. Hmm. And then when I started looking at articles that have been written about that topic, I noticed that regular was always categorized as a bad category and that Latinos consistently find are found at having higher odds of reporting worse health, reporting it. And I think it's a matter of the measures. It's a matter of that word that was included in that survey. Because when I called home and I heard she was doing regular, I I didn't cry. I wasn't sad. I wasn't, you know, it, it, it didn't uh -huh. mean that she was doing bad. Mm -hmm. But in this dichotomization that we do with the data, it does seems that that it gets categorized that way. And there's been some experiments with surveys where you replace the item with another item. And, and there's like the level of reporting of worst health deflates. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a, as, a as a native Spanish speaker, I was always wondering what else is hiding in the data. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you hear the headline, this is happening to someone. My question was always to whom, because it's not happening to me. So that, then came the idea of focusing on, on, on these different measures that we take for granted to be a, a universal association. This variable affects this variable this way. And so if you think about social support, for example, uh, if you come from a strong Latino culture, at, the, at least Puerto Rican, you know, the, the social support of your family comes as a given. Mm -hmm. So you expect to have some form of social support from your family. Uh, so what may be detrimental to you is not having it mm -hmm. rather than the, having it being uh, of benefit. And so that just kept, you know, I just kept peeking at different things and testing interactions to see whether the th these things we take for granted uh, at the population level, whether they actually apply to whole uh, subsectors of the population, such as um, racial and ethnic minorities or Puerto Ricans within the United States. And, you know, and those are the, that's the personal side of things. I always say my grandmother is my first uh, uh, professor of biobehavioral health because she was always measuring her blood sugar, her glucose levels, her triglycerides. She was always like, like measuring everything. And, and these words that I now use in my research are words that she actually used a lot in her daily life. Wow, that's that's pretty interesting. Now you make a good point. You know, sometimes when we look at the um, variables and categories of some of the surveys, we assume that they apply to everyone. You know, especially when it comes to diverse populations. And you're making the point, which is is good. I think it's important for people to understand that, especially if we translate to a different language. In this case, Spanish, it doesn't mean the same. So when people are responding to it, I think that we have to be real conscious about, is this the best translation possible? Or is, is this the best way people will understand when they're answering some kind of a survey? Will they really understand uh, what this means when they're answering based on what they're doing regular or often or maybe or you know whatever the, 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 the answer will be? Or when people say, how do you feel? Well, I feel poor today because I'm really feeling sick today. So that's poor health status. And sometimes they get reported. But reality, that's just at one given time. They might be, for the most part, they're doing okay. And, but there's not really an okay word on that category of health status, for example. So, you know, what else did influence you as you keep working in this area? You were developing your research area. Yeah. 
And just just to add to one thing you said before I move on to your question, uh, I I would bet you twenty five cents that you cannot find a single person that would describe their health as excelente or excellent. Yeah. Yet, because it's you're you're tempting fate. You're you're saying that everything is you know hundred percent right, and and that's a commonly used uh word in in the health surveys to notice to like be the the highest level of health a person may have. And, yeah. and so, you know, and as I kept just digging in, in the vast amount of data that are now available, thanks to the CDC, Wonder, and other type of, of, of uh, iPhones uh, and, and platforms, plat platforms like that, uh, I just kept digging at this and I just kept finding that the headline in the newspaper, the headline that I read, yeah. oftentimes when I test it in my computer, you know, uh, here running models, uh, tells me that that story is perhaps incomplete. And, and work that I've been conducting, you mentioned how often, right? When we ask a person, how often have you felt worried? And and then minorities tend to end up reporting less often that they're worried. And this has uh, fueled this narrative that minorities are resilient. On the other hand, if you look at more specific markers of worry, like are you worried about paying your bills? Are you worried about paying your house? Are you worried about uh, your like standard of living? In those things, minorities are doing worse. So that global measure that we're using mm -hmm. to reflect this idea of a uh, of like a resilient minority mm -hmm. has been great and great about a lot. Once you test it with more specific markers, questions that are more specific to specific dimensions. Then you like that that whole narrative crumbles, yeah. and and so that just that just keeps feeling fueling this idea that I just need to keep looking at whether these patterns that we keep hearing on the newspapers are actually true, and 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 if not, you know, uh, there's an opportunity to conduct the research, you know, pro pro produce the results and state the case that we that this situation may not be as simple as as we as we think and that's kind of what where a lot of my research is going now is looking at these heterogeneating effects. Now let, let's think about it for that resiliency for a minute because you mentioned something early about the support that is expected or is often in you know in, in different diverse families and you know like Puerto Rican families or Hispanic families, Latino families and so on. And a lot of the literature always say, well, you know, people have this family support that tend to be more resilient. And they do much better and so forth and so on. They're better to cope with everything that is bring throw at them, you know, daily basics, because they have this family support that help them cope with a lot of things that they might be dealing with. But then you on the other hand, you're saying, well, but that resiliency is not quite clear because it might depend on what's happening at the time or what they're going through or what how did you ask the question uh, when it comes to how they're dealing with the stressors, how they're dealing with, you know, daily life situations and so on. Is that right? Is that what you're, what you're finding in your research? Uh, some of it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, I think uh, what I'm trying to mention, you know, I'm not trying to, to say people are not being supported, uh, although there's uh, emerging evidence that there's, there's, some, uh, there's some people who are claiming that there's levels of social isolation that they're rising. Okay. Other research is not showing that particularly, but your networks, your family, they can provide the emotional support. They can help you like navigate a system. But the resources that a family may have, uh, you know, you need to play a little bit of household economics or home economics. Yeah. How do you assign resources? I I can remember when I was I didn't have a car until I went to college, and you know, and like my mom and my grandmother and an uncle had to pull money together. To get me a car because I had to drive to college every 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 day, uh, which was cheaper than than getting an apartment, and I think I don't think my family wanted me too far away to begin with. Yeah, yeah. But what I'm trying to get at here is that we take these patterns of so, so like think for example social support as this is a bonus. It's a bonus to your life, mm -hmm. but it's not a bonus to your life for everybody because some people have deeply ingrained in them through their cultures. And through who they are and through who their family is, that that support is going to be there. So yeah. when we think about these potential benefits, you know, for me, it, it it was always a question of who is going to help grandma, not 
not whether we are going to, it was going to be who is going to do it. Yeah. And like through that lens is that I'm trying to like look at the results and I'm trying to understand the mechanisms underlying these associations that we're now finding in this emerging line of work we're doing. So going back to my previous question, so what else uh, influenced you in your career as you were growing up? What you know, what other things, experiences got you where you are now? Um, honestly, a lot of people who believed in me, if you think about you know, what experiences, it was uh, people who took the time to provide mentorship. Uh, when I was studying in Calle, uh, I was uh, so I was mentored by actually a Penn State alumni, Dr. Jose Noel Caraballo. And uh, he was uh, the only professor who taught statistics. And he taught statistics at 7.30 a.m. Monday, wow. uh, Tuesdays, and Thursdays. And I'm definitely not a morning person, but I actually was a statistics person. So he 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 took uh, the time and taught a couple of classes uh, ad honorem or without compensation. Mm -hmm. And and he taught us statistics. So when I was in my undergrad uh, completing this minor in statistics, I was learning R. I was learning learning coding when like no when nobody was using R. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was now that I look back, I say, well, this guy took the time to teach me. Mm -hmm. And he would occasionally bring me a book because he heard me talk about a game theory. And he would say, oh, I found this book in my house. And he would give it to me. And I think he shaped a lot of the ways I think about mentorship. And we can talk about that later. But like that guy, he really, really saw something in me and told me how to strategize uh, to make it. Because I back then, I wanted to do a PhD in economics. And until this day, I, I stay in touch with him. But, you know, along the way, I've had encounter a lot of people that have helped me keep my research alive. Mm -hmm. And these are facilitators for my research area. Uh, in my master's, you know, I was told by the most eminent uh, scholar on health economics in Puerto Rico, that study you want to do is impossible. And, you know, I left his office kind of sad. And then I... I, I he bumped into this other guy who is an economic historian and he told me, oh, we can definitely do that. And so it's like, and, and, and this keeps happening all around. And, you know, I've been, I've, I've been blessed to encounter people along the way that I sit down and I talk to them about ideas and they, they see a path forward. And I think it's something that I keep trying to think about is whenever somebody brings me an idea is what is the path forward? What, how well we can make it happen. But more importantly, uh, my research is also uh, guided by a primary source that is my mom. Uh, my mom is a nurse in Puerto Rico. And for example, when I was studying the deaths after Hurricane Maria, uh, it was her who, like the first person who told me, uh, listen, you, uh, there's a lot of people dying in the hospital. And the number cannot be at that low. And I said, okay, let me just go and check the data. And so it's not only, you know, what has happened in my past, but also staying somehow connected to Puerto Rico and to the context I'm studying. Uh, and like that example with my mom, I can give you two or three or four more examples of, of things that keep me uh, kind of like this flame of wanting to do research on topics of heterogeneity and even demographics of Puerto Rico alive, because it's, it's much needed, it's much appreciated and and it keeps Puerto Rico in the discussion, or keeps the topic in in the in the public discussion. No, oh, that that's that's really good to know. I mean, I'm sure because she's there and she's seen what you probably have not seen on looking at just the data. It provided that, as you said, that flame to really go and in deep into what the data is or is not telling us when it comes to the realities of you know disparities, if you will, in some of these populations. Now, let me shift a little bit on, um, as you have worked with, you know, the data that address the needs or the issues of diverse populations, what kind of challenge have you encountered? What kind of things have you have to like sit for a minute and say, okay, this doesn't seem to work, or it's not what I'm looking at, or it's too complex, or it's too difficult, or whatever it is that you you have gone through that, that lead you to think about, is this really what I'm doing or something else that I should be doing? Yeah, absolutely. So there's three things that I think I've encountered uh, one is geographic, right? We we are in the middle of, of State College, Pennsylvania, Center County, and it's very difficult to like to find diverse populations from which uh, to collect data and and, and do studies. Um, so that is certainly a challenge, and I think there's initiatives now to connect with the population in Harrisburg, and and even my collaborations in Puerto Rico will uh, be vehicles for that. But 
the first thing I would say is that when you want to, like the second thing, the second element of the uh, that I would highlight is you know, access to good data about diverse populations that includes all the, the all the information that you may need to like pursue a question. Uh, when I was uh, starting uh, my career, uh, it seems that the like the common comment was, there's no data about Puerto Rico, for example, mm -hmm. and and then that that was the constant complaint that we would have as Puerto Rican scholars is there's no data about Puerto Rico, and it, that's still partially true, but how is it that if there's no data, I have been able to pursue these these research inquiries that I have. Well, the thing is that the research that the data may be there. It's just the data may not be accessible, mm -hmm. and that is one of the situations that that we're trying to work to facilitate. Uh, also, there's a lot of mistrust in 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 someone coming and collecting data. Uh, very recently, I helped a, a mental health uh, organization in Puerto Rico to conduct a uh, uh, community health. Uh, needs assessment, and it was very interesting to hear the level of of anger that the people would talk to us about in their dealings with the healthcare system and how much they didn't want to provide information because nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing changes. Mm -hmm. So that has been a, a big challenge for for us to engage with populations, collect data, and be able to produce results that ultimately are, are going to lead to more funding for mental health services in the in the region. Um, and I think the third is that once that because the work I'm doing is trying to test whether these well-established patterns hold for different sectors of the population, mm -hmm. one of the problems I find is that when you submit this paper for review, you have reviewer number two telling <laughs> you, uh, you must be doing something wrong. Yeah. Because you're if you're doing this type of work and you're trying to like uncover patterns for very specific populations or diverse populations and you're going to be challenging notions, then you're going to encounter someone who will tell you, oh, it's not working probably because you're doing a mistake. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's it's a little bit more difficult to uh, publish mm -hmm. in this topic uh, because you also do not, it's not only uncovering these hidden patterns in the data, but it's also doing the sales pitch <laughs> through the writing. You know, it has to be well written. It has to be well argued so that, you know, at least you get the opportunity of revising and resubmit. But but in the work that we've been doing, particularly with this, this idea of worry that I'm exploring with uh, with uh, Sara Soto, a student in clinical psychology, uh, that we, we've encountered a lot is theoretically underdeveloped. And <laughs> what mm -hmm. I, you know, one of the things I was like, was telling her is there's there's no theory about this. We there's there's nothing we can do here. Uh, but we but we had that has made us go back to the drawing board and actually like create a stronger argument. Try and tell people, listen, this is what's going on. <laughs> the heterogeneity in these effects. So those would be for me three things. And I think a fourth, if I would need to to say something, is that. You know, particularly in the research I do in Puerto Rico, the University of Puerto Rico has been got it. They they cut their budget fifty percent, and and it's and and it's it's very under resourced. So uh, there's you know, the to do to do research there. It's it's a little bit complicated mm -hmm. because people oftentimes are juggling three jobs or they're doing adjuncting in three or four institutions, and and they don't have time to sit down and and write because they're teaching a lot. Mm -hmm. And 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 that certainly is they're so close to the population I want to study, but the same and 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 so there's this disconnect because they're so close, yet they don't have the resources, and I may have the resources, but I'm very far away. Mm -hmm. So like trying to like see how this geographic distance becomes less of a challenge is it, something that we have. We're going to the drawing board a lot, think creatively about how to conduct these studies and collect the data we need. Now, one thing I'm thinking I was listening to you is the idea of using data and access to data. I think one of the challenges sometimes we face in research is that some of the data that's available, like, you know, through the public health department or some of the other national data sets, are at least a few years old. Mm -hmm. I always wonder, is this as accurate as it can be or or how much is missing from it? Because the way it was collected, it wasn't, it wasn't inclusive of some of these maybe variables that you're looking at. 
So is that something that you have, you know, faced yeah. with? Yeah, absolutely. There's uh, you know, countless cases that I can tell you that I have one data set that has one variable. I have another data set that has the other variable, but they don't, they, they <laughs> like, but those variables are not together in one survey. Yeah. And I think it's because of the way things have been set up, you know, if you are doing the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, you don't want to collect data that's been collected by another NIH institute. Mm -hmm. And that may pose its own challenges um, to uh, to how much we can push forward science. Uh, certainly there's a delay, but the IPUMS platform, for example, uh, it's very good at updating even like the current population survey, they update it every month with one or two months of lag. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's relatively quick. Uh, but like, let me tell you, I, I probably I can tell you one example of these. There's a particular group of population that I like to study, and I haven't been doing a lot of uh, progress on this area, but it's uh, the, the adult, young adults and adolescents who are neither engaged in education or in employment. So in, 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 in Latino cultures, they call them the ninis, you know, ni estudia ni trabaja, which sure. is in Europe, is they're no, known as the needs, and I think in the United States there there's a name that's being proposed is opportunity youth, right? Like and so the health dynamics of this group is 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 interesting, vastly understudied in the United States, and and they're the two I think it's uh, 24 million people, uh, in that age group fall in this category at some point. So it's not a small group; it's more than the population of 20 states. Mm -hmm. uh, but the the you need an analysis or a survey that allows you to determine whether a person is in school and whether they're employed. And in some surveys, if one of those is true, you don't ask the other. In other, you don't ask the unemployed, the employment questions to people under 18, although they're eligible for work. Mm -hmm. It's been only in a very, in and then other surveys only include information for adults. Mm -hmm. So that means that 18 and over, so you don't have the 16 and 17 then that's a very small subsector of the population that is vastly unaddressed, but I think there's a lot of opportunities to do work in this area, but you need to go and do a little bit of data archeology span to try and find the right data set that contains the information you need to, to do the, that, to pursue projects in that group, for example. So we talk about some of these challenges. Let's flip the coin around and talk about some of the success stories that you have had, you know, based on the research you've been doing and you know everything you've been trying to accomplish in your career. Yes. Um, well, I have two or three examples I can give you. I think the first one is uh, the, 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 the kind of my first home run, which was the work of, uh, of post-Hurricane Maria mm -hmm. mortality. The, the government was saying 16 deaths have been certified, and then they upped the number to 60. And after they give the 16 number to the press, and and that from what I have was observing in the news and also from conversations with my mom, I, I pretty much uh, found uh, that the number was highly unlikely to be 16, you know, mm -hmm. but there was a lot of devastation that occurred in Puerto Rico. And, and we wrote uh, uh, sort of like a, a draft of a manuscript. And back then, I didn't know anything about this platform called uh, search archive, but it's, it's, it's an archive, you know, it's a place where you can post a preprint and a person can read it beforehand. And, uh, I posted it and a journalist saw it, uh, covered the story. And then from that first coverage, like a lot of other media outlets, uh, covered, uh, the story again. And so back then I was speaking with the press almost like once every, uh, every two or three days. Uh, giving them a lot of information of the data that I had. And, and so that was like the first moment in which I said, wow, the research can actually affect change and drive discussions. And I participated in a couple of podcasts on, on that matter, which brought, uh, uh, allowed me to connect with a lot of people. I think that, and, and so that's focusing on Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other one, the, the, the uh, most recent work I've been doing on whether the, the US census new method for data processing is affecting the data we get from the census in terms of the racial ethnic composition of different places. Mm -hmm. uh, that also has been very good because uh, I have been able to highlight 
the shortcomings of the system in comparison to a previous one. And, you know, and I pretty much have been telling the census, you need to revise this method because what the data you're proposing to give us is data that we cannot use reliably to understand the demographic profile mm -hmm. of specific places. And I had a, a presentation even at the National Academies where I spoke about this, and it, it, it also gained a lot of coverage. And, but more importantly, you know, working with a diverse population also drives people from that diverse population uh, to like ask you questions. And, and one very successful case has been uh, my former postdoc, Emil Carmatos, who I've been in touch with. We met in a conference about 10 years ago and I, we kept in touch during the time he was doing his PhD. And when he was finishing, was finishing the PhD in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I asked him, you know, how's the job market looking for you? And he said, well, it's not, I'm still, you know, I'm still have some applications out. Mm -hmm. And I I asked one of my colleagues uh, from the Department of Sociology, Ashton Bergery, whether he would consider uh, hosting a postdoctoral fellow under the diversity supplement program. Mm -hmm. And and we wrote it for him and we got it. Uh, he was able to stay as a postdoc for us for two years, wrote his grants, uh, kept doing a lot of the work on Puerto Rico that I wasn't able to do. And, but for me, it was very interesting because this connection wouldn't have been possible if I hadn't been in touch with him and talking to him uh, every once in a while. And so that's another way of working with a diverse population as part of the research, right? Because it, it's more on the mentoring side. Mm -hmm. and, and that is something now that I have replicated. I have a post back working with me uh, now in one of my projects to a, another diversity supplement. I was a, a recipient of a diversity supplement myself, but it's something that uh, I see a success stories. Every time I can I can help someone, uh, I, I I I see success. So moving along. Uh, so as a person from underrepresented background, you know the presented groups, what challenge have you encountered in as part of your career at Penn State? Huh. Um, I would say, hey Sam. Uh, I would say. I I would say I encountered a couple of them. I think because I grew up in Puerto Rico, then I went to San Antonio. I was not as aware of my surroundings as I could have when I moved here. So I wasn't looking for the things that were happening around me uh, to begin with. And uh, but you know, one one time it was very clear to me uh, through like dialogues, for example, that success was only defined as the big names in disciplines. Mm -hmm. And and when the names were listed, there was not a single Latino on them, and and and, and that was something that opened my eyes to these. You know, even during a launch, there could be there could be conversations that that can hurt a little bit, you know. And 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 that is certainly one of the things that that I need to keep thinking about. Is like, I, you know, I'm gonna get there, you know. But like, there's a, a lot of biases and other things that we need to overcome. Um, and you know, help people address it. I think I've, I've, I, I've been surrounded by people who have been willing to ask questions that are difficult to ask, and and I think we have a good, you know, level of synchrony and conversation. And I feel happy that they can talk to me about that. But I think the the big issue is that we as underrepresented minorities oftentimes are thought of persons who are going to be working on the efforts to fix what is wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily true. We mm -hmm. like uh, uh, our job is is to exist in an institution where there's a lot of blind spots. Mm -hmm. And and so we can aid in trying to address some of the inequalities and the systems that are shaping those inequalities. But you know, fixing it requires power. Mm -hmm. It requires uh to understand what it takes to fix something. So it, it it may be, you may be setting me up for like failure if you're giving me a task of fixing a system that has existed for years yeah. uh, with this. And maybe the idea would be to rebuild. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but certainly I've like, and I've, I've grown myself a lot because I used to be like a reformist, you know, it's like, oh, we can change it, we can change it. But nowadays, everyone needs to like start 
like with a, with a clean board and and that for me is one of the things i think that the 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 loneliness of of state college is something that that is also a social challenge mm -hmm. and you know Penn state cannot control anything because it's a geographic enclave on it but that that has implications for attracting uh competitive students not that i don't have a, uh, that i'm not surrounded by a, a lot of competitive students but oftentimes i reach out to people in conferences and i talk to them and i said oh why don't you apply to penn state and i i, I was like they laugh and say, like, no, I'm not going to stay college or I'm not going to, because it's, 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 it's difficult to be here. And I, and I'm cognizant of that myself. So there's, there's, I think that, that would be for me kind of like the, the, the main things. Uh, certainly I've, I've been blessed to be surrounded by a lot of people who have done a lot of work to understand the value of these type of research. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been supported by DSSRI uh, and to, and the position that I will apply to was uh, a position that came as kind of as a package deal for the social disparities cluster. Mm -hmm. So as long as I'm addressing social disparities, I'm doing well, and 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 they've been amazing at being cheerleaders for 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 these type of research. Um, but that's that's not without challenges because I think oftentimes, um, you know, even requests to be part of a group, uh, uh, oftentimes the the question becomes, are you inviting me? Because I'm Latino, or you're inviting me because mm -hmm. I'm a researcher, mm -hmm. and that is that is also something that that has occurred once, and 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 I I've, the person then said both. I said okay, okay we're good, uh, but it it made me question also, and it's not uh, uh, an isolated experience because I've shared this with some other Puerto Rican faculty members, um, and I, I know we're running out of time, but I, I would say also the. The in terms of being an underrepresented minority, what I would say is that oftentimes I see some level of urgency mm -hmm. when a student says, "I don't understand this," or "I don't like," or "I'm having trouble with this." I see some level of urgency on it that maybe other people say, "Oh, you just gotta let it, let it, you know, let it age," right? And and oftentimes I I try to think, does the students have the has the time to let it age, you know, or whether this is a major roadblock. So it's it's also that that trying to balance that that sense of like let them be independent versus uh, kind of like take care of them. Mm -hmm. And often and I've had to learn how to deal with that also. Um, and but yeah, that's those are the like the grand grander scheme of things that would be my my bigger things. And and I don't know if, if I've addressed your question completely. Yeah, but. yeah, you, yeah. I think you got most of it. And you also talk about some of the success stories, but I, I was, I want to, I don't know, we have, we, we have like 40 minutes or so left, but I wanted to say something. I remember when we, we talked for the first time, you say, Hey, I've been looking for somebody like you for a long, long time. Oh and, yeah. You know, I was like, well, okay, well, I don't know how to take that, whether it's, you know, it's great or not, but, but I think you, I think in the point is, I think sometimes when you're in a big university, you feel like yourself, you're the only one of whatever category might, that might be within an underrepresented group. So you feel like, you know, there's nobody else like me out there who maybe understand my challenges, that might understand where I'm coming from, that I might understand, you know, all the things that I go through and maybe having somebody else like that is great because then I can relate. I think that's, yeah, that, that's, that's how I meant that. I'm sorry yeah, if it yeah. didn't come across that way. Yeah, but yeah. And you find out that there's like our friend Mirtha yeah. is, is a professor in the Spanish department. There's another professor in biology that is also Puerto Rican. Yeah. So it's, it just seems that we are around. It's just that we're not as connected. Yeah, yeah. So that's part of that. So as we go in, because I want to allow some time for questions for the audience, if any of them, before we lose some of the other people. Uh, you talk about some of the success career stories. You talk about some of the people who have shared for you, you know, some of the resources that you got from SSRI and other uh, entities and so on. What lessons have you learned that you want to share with other people in similar situations? Mm. Research-wise, I think it's, it's as long as you feel that the the idea is worth your investment and your uh, you know, seek and, and investment of resources and time, mm -hmm. I would say that that ideas should be pursued, should be given life, and at least uh, being uh, entertained. Like I think that's that's a luxury that we have being in a more resourced university than than in other settings. Um, I think I've learned to also be able to. Let me see how I put this. That 
being able to find a person that you can share ideas with who is knowledgeable of maybe the past past challenges that people have encountered when doing so. So years ago, when I was trying to go before the pandemic to go and collect some biomarkers in Puerto Rico, uh, the the person who was the, uh, the SSRI director back then, uh, Susan McHale, she told me, you need to speak with Orfeo Buxton, right? And she became these kind of like goodwill ambassador for the institution telling me, go talk with this person. We talk with this person and here are the resources. Um, that so number one, entertain ideas, you know, give them a little bit of life. Uh, number two is find out what resources are available. If you don't know, ask. Uh, that's I've been very surprised about the amount of resources available and software Penn State has available for us. Um, and and number three, you know, I would say that it is important to build a a village, your own village. It's important to build the people around you with whom you can go and get a coffee or with whom you can go and just go for a walk and talk. Mm -hmm. uh, that has been tremendously helpful for me over the last eight years at Penn State. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and you know, finding uh, finding your people. You know, when I said I was, lo I've been looking for you all this time, I, I, I truly meant it that way. I said yeah. like, you know, I, like at some point you and I will go for a walk and have a conversation. Yeah. Uh, and, and so for me, that's very important. It's building your, not only your knowledge uh, on, on the institution, but also uh, building the group of support. So if, you, if I can think about, you know, the past, for example, I'm I'm only here because of, you know, the amazing people that have been there to help me. Uh, and I don't, I don't want to like, like I'll take half a minute to say that growing up, we had these neighbors would always take us out on Fridays, me and my brother uh, for dinner, just because. Mm -hmm. and, and they 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 were kind of like these these plus two parents that 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 life gave us and and they they were people who always taught me to entertain ideas and and you know be there for others and and I think that's there's a human side of academia that that I think we need to like we're, we're told to shush a little bit but I think we need to embrace it a little bit more uh, and you know with that I think we're Ten minutes to go, right? Yeah, I think I'm gonna then open this to anyone in the audience and uh, who might have a question for Alexis. So you can either put your question in the chat, and I can read it, or if you wanna, you mute yourself for a minute and ask your question. Please do so. I think they need to be allowed to talk, so. That's something we can do behind the scene. Uh, Jen? Look at that. I left them speechless. <laughs> That's what happened. Now, I guess, tell, uh, okay. Um, that sounds good. I guess because it's a webinar, it's hard for them to talk, but they can chat on their questions. So if anybody questions you have, a Q and A area that you can post questions. You can do it in the chat. Either way, uh, we can address those. Now, uh, let me ask you this: since you've been here for eight years or so on, for someone, and we have at least one person, and there was another person who just, I guess, needed to go. But for young Latinos, you know, from young Latinos who are just starting their careers or thinking about down the road whether they're going to pursue a, you know, continue for a master's degree or doctor degree or so on, you know, what advice would you give them? I would. So the first thing I would say is um, think about think about it a lot if you're going to invest in a master's degree. Uh, I would always tell people just go to Puerto Rico. If you speak Spanish, you get a, a great education uh, for 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 like a lower a cost. But if not, uh, for Latinos who are starting their career, and I know exactly who you're talking about, uh, probably Stephen, right? Uh, uh, yeah, he was there, but I think he just. Um, about uh, so I would say you know seek. Uh, always ask. Um, uh, always ask about whether a person can help you with something. So one of the things that I keep telling people is just go to a reporter in NIH, look at who has a grant, and write to them. Are you willing to host someone as a diversity scholar to a diversity supplement? And so that is that is a this a you know it takes a lot of. Uh, energy and it took a lot of courage to do it, 
but oftentimes we need to be the advocates for ourselves. And, and that is true in any you know, dimension that you're going to encounter is you need to educate whoever is reviewing you. And like, if you're writing a paper, you educate your reviewer. If you're writing uh, your, your, the person, your application for a PhD program, you're educating the admissions department about who you are and what you want to accomplish. And for me, that is, uh, and, and for that, for me, that is very important. And also, you know, reach out to other faculty members uh, or to faculty members uh, mm -hmm. who may, you know, have some insight. I think it's always about lowering the walls. And, and you know, we think about, we keep asking about networking and networking. And networking is great. Everybody has their profiles online and everything else. But I found that, that this meaningful connection, reaching out mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe trying to say I'm visiting uh, campus. I was wondering if I could stop by. And, you know, you hear success stories of, diversity supplement recipients all the time. Uh, there's no reason why, you know, like you, the, if you don't send it, the answer is no already. Yeah. So if you send it and the answer becomes yes, then you're on to something. And and that's what I try to instill also in, in my mentees and my postdocs and my PhD students that I work with. Someone just commented that they do appreciate your sharing your human side as something being uh, meaningful. Also, that they're trying similar things in their department to increase diversity. Yeah. Um, so um, one of the things that we do is this: we have this little poll that hopefully is open right now before we all leave. So if you can take a minute to answer it, the question is: you know, how you the series are helping understand some of the challenges faced by underrepresented faculty when conducting the research. Also, if you want to, in the chat, you're going to share uh, how you think this uh, section have impacted you in general when it comes to working with diverse population. We can also entertain some of those comments that we appreciate it. And as we continue to do this poll, um, I guess, uh, let's see if any other questions or anything from the audience. I don't see anything right now. We still have a few minutes if any, anybody else wants to share. We also will have a post-session survey evaluation that is uh, in the chat right now. Um, so please uh, make sure you complete that. It will help us when you come to our next uh, Amplifying Lion Voices section. In We try to do this quarterly. So our next one will be sometime in um, probably May. April, May, uh, you know, before everybody leaves for the summer. So that's something you want to know. Uh, Kels is saying, so it was great to hear how your family is structured and bringing influence your path to where you're now. I think it's very important to keep in mind when interacting with anyone as we don't know where people are coming from or what experience they have bring to the table. And I think that's important. I think that's one of the reasons that I wanted to have on these Amplifying Voices. You know, you humanize in the researcher, behind the research. You know, they know the research, they can read it, they understand what you're doing, but sometimes people don't understand the, the background. You know, how these people got here? Who, who is this person itself? Can we learn, you know, can we learn to take a minute just to know a little bit more about who Alexis is or whoever the, the person might be speaking? Because that tells you so much more about who the person is and how you maybe collaborate or interact with them. And I think that's one of the reasons we created these uh, sections to really get to that point of really knowing the person more than just a piece of paper they're publishing some articles and so on. Yeah, and I think that's back to the human side of things, right? It's, there's a human dimension in yeah. people we work with. And, you know, it doesn't have to be like you need to be on, on, like, on, on their speed dial and everything that happens, but this big event that they told you about, oh, how did things when your kids play or the soccer game? Mm -hmm. And uh, I often uh, the first thing I ask when I when I have my students, my postdoc working with me is how is everything going? How's your family? Mm -hmm. If they decide to answer, that's that's on them, right? But I'm opening the door to showing them that it's it's okay to talk about these things because I also talk about my family and even in class, I present examples like that. Yep, it's part of being uh, authentic and it's part of being you know who we are as you know as human beings and researchers and. Faculty members and you know and, and everything else, uh, Penn State members and all of that. Um, let's see. Any any other comments, questions on the chat? We have like a few minutes left. 
So as we conclude this section, if I don't see any comments, I just want to, again, thank you for your time and uh, for uh, taking the time to share your story with the rest of us. Uh, this is being uh, recorded, so we will keep this on our library to share with other people that might didn't have the chance to be uh, here today. I know we have probably over 35 people who have signed for it, but you know the, the attendance was a little lower than than the number who people signed. So you know, like always at Penn State, there's so many things going on that sometimes it's hard to connect to everything that we would like to be part of. So you know, we will have this available in the next uh, uh, few weeks, and we will send a link out to people. Uh, we will also probably will follow up with some kind of story of uh, this section on CTSI newsletter. So keep track of that and stay tuned for future sections. And if anybody in the audience knows of somebody who could be a great uh, speaker or somebody we can uh, have our, our, in our NES Amplifying Lion Voices, please let me know. Uh, I will type my uh, email in the, in the chat if anybody want to contact me directly. We have some names, but if you have some other names of people you think would be great to share the stories, please do so. Contact, uh, contact me directly and we will talk to them as we move forward in this section. Once again, Alexis, thank you. Gracias for the tiempo. And uh, thanks uh, Jennifer and the Shear team for uh, doing all the uh, behind the scene work to have this together today. And we will see you uh, in another section in another the next quarter. Again, thank you again for all of you who attended, and we hope to see you soon. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>